I'll be turning over to Luke, the 15th chapter. <clears throat> this chapter is one uh, that's often been called the threefold parable chapter, because, and it illustrates God's way, God's grace, and God's joy for us. Jesus has is responding to the uncaring nature of the Pharisees and scribes in this these parables. Because as we see, the publicans and sinners came near to hearing verse 1. And to this, the self-righteous and uncaring Pharisees and scribes uh, they objected to such as individuals and in Jesus teaching them. Uh, you see in going back to chapter 14 that Jesus uh, has taught the cost of discipleship and that one must count the cost, verses 25 through 35. But in verse 25 of Luke 14, he tells us that there went great multitudes, and uh, he turned and said unto them as he began teaching this about counting the cost. Uh, the great multitude certainly included these of chapter 15 and verse 1, the publicans and sinners who came to hear him. And we see this, or we see Jesus' compassion on the lost in this. But in these parables, we see that the lost are to be found. And once they are found, the return of those that are lost brings joy to heaven. And so last week, we noted how that this describes love for us in that first the shepherd loses one of his 100 sheep and yet he leaves the 99 and goes to search for the one. The woman who has 10 coins loses one and she searches diligently sweeping the house lighting a candle or a light and sought it diligently until she found the one coin. And then the father whose son leaves, we see the love that he has for him. But also when the older son refuses to come in, he goes out to entreat the uh, older son. And so we start seeing the, the love that God has for us. And throughout the scriptures we see that love being demonstrated to us Primarily, we see the greatest demonstration in the fact that Jesus died for our sins, that God sent His only begotten Son to die for us, John 3.16. But also, these parables teach us that God's loss is evidenced. Sometimes when people sin and do things they turn it all to themselves and say, well, don't worry, it only hurts me. It's only me. doesn't affect anyone else. But these parables show us that that's not the case. When that sheep got lost, it affected the shepherd. When the coin was lost, it affected the woman. And then when the son was lost, it affected the father. And when the older son refused, it affected him. Paul would write in Romans 14th chapter and verse 7, that none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. He's making the point that what we do affects other individuals. When we commit sin, it's going to affect others. It's going to affect our family. It's going to affect our friends. It's going to affect all of those individuals upon whom we have a influence. Those individuals who could be here this evening and don't. They've made 
a choice in their decision, but that choice that they made not to come has affected other individuals. All of those that they could have influenced for good, that good is going to be destroyed because of the choices that they made. But it also affects God in heaven. If we go back to the time of Noah, the God describes the world of that day as that every thought of man was only evil continually. And because of that, it says in Genesis 6 and verse 6, that it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. Why was God grieved? Because of the sin of the people, those individuals that He had created, that He had cared for, that He had preserved. And yet, their sins caused God grief. When we look at Israel and how Israel so many times uh, turned away from God, the 95th Psalm in verse 10, God says, Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. I was grieved with that generation. Why? Because of their, as we find elsewhere, unbelief. Hebrews the third chapter and verse 10 repeats that aspect. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. And then a few verses later in verse 17, he again states it. But with whom he was grieved forty years, was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Here's these individuals who did not believe in God. Oh, they believed in His existence. But they didn't really believe God. They had seen His powerful works in bringing them out of Egypt. The deliverance that He made for them in parting the Red Sea. They had been there as God delivered unto them His message so much so that they were scared, we might say, out of their wits says, we don't want to hear God. Moses, you go up and you hear Him. And you can bring that message back to us. And then when it comes time to go into the promised land, what do they do? All oh, the people there, they're giants. They have walled cities. They're strong. We can't do it. They didn't believe in God. And so God was grieved with them because of their unbelief. We need to realize that we, that man, is valuable to God. If for no other reason because of the price that was paid. A man's soul, Jesus says, is worth more than all of the world's goods put together. In Matthew 16 and verse 26, when he says, For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Man's soul is so valuable that it's worth more than all of the riches of the world. Now, a price that we pay for an object determines really what the value of that object is worth. The price of the souls of man was the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 26 and verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I'm shedding my blood so that you can be saved, so that man can be saved. How valuable is man to God? He's so valuable that he would give his only begotten son. There's the price, the blood of Christ. Peter would write in 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through verse 20, for as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the world foundation of the world and was manifest in these last times for you. 
gold, silver, it cannot redeem you. But God wanted to buy us back because of His great love for us. And that's what we looked at last week. Here's God's great love. Here's the love that we see in these three parables demonstrated by first the shepherd who goes seeking the one lost sheep. The woman who lights a candle, sweeps the house, searches diligently for the one coin. The father who looks longingly into distance for his son to return home and then goes out to entreat the older one. A love of the father But He could not redeem us and we were not redeemed with gold and silver. Those things that are valuable to man on this world. But He says, instead, what redeemed us, what brought us back to God is the precious blood of Christ. We're redeemed then to serve God. So many times what we do is we sit down to do nothing within the kingdom of God. We become a Christian. We're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. We're raised up out of that water grave of baptism to sit down and do nothing. At least that's so many times what Christians do. I'm saved. I've got it made. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to say anything. I don't even have to change my life is what some think and all will be right. Why, I'm not an evil person. I don't go out killing others. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't do all of these other things. I'm not an evil person, so I've got to be all right. And we think Christianity is simply a religion of knots. I don't do this. I don't do that. And we forget that Christianity is a religion that demands of us service to God. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20 tells us that we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Jesus would teach us in Matthew 5th chapter verse 16 to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christianity is, just, is not simply, I don't steal, I don't do this, I don't lie, I don't murder, I don't commit adultery, I don't drink, I don't do that, I don't do this. All those things are wrong, certainly, and we are not to do those things. But if that's what we're judging our Christianity by, then we've got the wrong standard. Christianity is going out and actively working in the kingdom of our Lord. In Romans the sixth chapter, Paul discusses that very thing and he reminds them of their salvation, how that they were baptized into Christ. And in being baptized into Christ, being baptized into His death, buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And He shows how that we have died to that old man of sin, but we have died to that old man of sin so that we can be servants of righteousness. Look at verse 17 of Romans 6. Or look at verse 13 where he tells us, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. What is, you yield your body now because you have been bought with a price to glorify God in your body. To let your light so shine before men that they will see that good works that you're doing. So Christianity is not simply a religion. I didn't do this and I didn't do that. But it is a going out and actively working in the vineyard of our Lord. And that's certainly what God expects of us. 
we need to have that same feeling for the lost as did our Lord. That would cause us to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19 and verse 10 as he describes his own life. When we have though that same feeling for the lost as our Lord, it's going to prompt us to get out and work for Him. To engage in seeking and saving the lost. Or as we see here in these parables, where the shepherd goes out to seek the lost, lost or the shepherd goes out to, to seek the lost sheep. The woman seeks diligently the lost coin. A love that the father has for his son. That he's looking for him and longing for him to come home. And then of that elder son who will go out to him to try and bring him back into the fold. But we also see not only God's loss, but God's long-suffering nature becomes clear in this. This is especially true in that last parable, the parable of the lost son. A loving father as we refer to it, though, the par parable of the prodigal son. Here is this young son, the younger of the two. And the deceitful things of this world drew that young son. Notice verse 13 of Luke 15. That not many days after, the younger son gathered all, all together and took his journey into a far country and wasted his substance with riotous living. That far country were, was drawing that young man. He was thinking about the things there. And so he gathers all of his things and he leaves. The world does have an attraction. We need to realize that there is an attraction in the things of this world and living like the world. In Luke 8 and verse 14, in the parable of the sower, he tells us that that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit for, uh, to perfection. The riches, the pleasures, the cares of this world. We become so wrapped up with this world and the things of this world that Christianity is literally choked out of us. Isn't that what we see in so many who profess to be Christians today? That the things of this world are so important to them and they just don't have time for Christianity. They don't have time to go out and teach the lost. They don't have time to study the Bible. They don't have time to many times even attend the worship services of the church. They don't have time to be involved in the visitation program. They don't have time to do anything for the Lord because they filled it up with the things of this world. And notice... Not only does he say the cares and riches, but he says the pleasures of this world. There is pleasure in sin. We need to realize that. But it is a temporary pleasure. It's not a pleasure that will bring lasting joy and happiness, lasting peace, lasting purpose. It's not going to give us anything to really live for. But there is a pleasure there. There is a joy that is there. And the riches and the cares of this world become so important. And that's what happened to this younger son. The pleasures of this world, of this life, became so important that he left the father's home. He left the blessings of the home for the call of the world. 
But in reality, the call of the world only leads to ruin. The book of Ecclesiastes is dealing all with that. He begins, though, by telling us, Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 2, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And he goes from there, and he, if you look at the introduction to that book, the first few verses, he's dealing with all of the things in this life, all of the cares, all of the pleasures, all of the riches of this world. Everything under the sun. What is it? It is vanity, he says. It's worthlessness. It has no value. And Solomon goes through one thing after another thing within his life, Testing them out to see if there's really any value in them. If there's true purpose of life. If there's true joy that's going to be found there. And he had, let's face it, he had all of the riches that an individual could want. All of the wealth that he could provide himself with anything, any desire that crossed his mind. And so what did he do? He'd go from one... Say, well, let's see, Does, is this going to bring me joy? Is it going to bring me true pleasure? Is it going to bring me peace of the mind and heart? And he would try it. And his conclusion, it's vanity. It's worthlessness. Moses had learned their lesson, though, centuries before. When, as the Hebrews writer states in Hebrews 11 and verse 25, that he was choosing to, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He realized, yes, here is all of the wealth and riches of Pharaoh that are at my disposal. I can enjoy all of the things of this world the pleasures of this world. But he realized that those pleasures were only for a season. They weren't lasting. And so instead of choosing those pleasures of the world and the riches that were available to him, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Why? Because he knew that's where true joy and peace and happiness would reside. This younger son dismissed what we can learn, for example, in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. When John tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not any. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are not of the Father, but of but are of the world. And the world passeth away in the lusts thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. His affections turn toward the world instead of the things of God. He longed for and had a love for the world and the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what was the love of his life instead of the love for God. Or he could have and should have learned what James would tell us in James 4 and verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. And this young son, he looked out there and he saw the world and he wanted to be the friend of the world. And so he left the father's home. But also we can see the path that he uh, led to the world. Because he made plans to leave. The younger son said unto the father, Give me the portions that fall to me. And then not many days after, he made his plans to leave the father's home to go out into the world and to see the, seek the things of the world and have that love and friendship with the world. What happened? Apostasy filled his heart before the actual leaving took place. 
he was looking out at the things of the world. That's where his heart was residing. And because his heart was residing there, he left. He went away. A lot of times we get to someone who has apostatized, who has left the church, but we get to them way too late. We, leave, we get to them after they've left. Instead of preventing it, they're leaving. Their leaving isn't... That wasn't the problem. The problem resided far before they left. There was a problem within their life, whatever it might have been, that caused them to leave. They were thinking about the things of the world and the love of the world, and because of that, they left. But the apostasy of the heart preceded their actual leaving. But then, there was not only the plans to leave then, there was then the taking of his journey into a far country. He began going the opposite direction of the way in which he should be going. Living the way in which he should not be living. Then, he started making the wrong kinds of friends. He didn't have the good influence of a loving father who was there who would have helped him. He wasted his substance with riotous living. His friends, no doubt, there for his riotous living, but when the money run, runs out, so do the friends. But they were no, not good as far as an influence upon his life. And we're reminded what Paul would write that Evil companionships corrupt good morals, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33. We need, and one of the great purposes of our visitation program is the social aspect of it so that we will know one another better and we will be friends with one another and we can thus encourage one another in our Christian living. When all of our friends, though, were worldly and pulling us toward the world, then it's going to be very difficult for us to remain faithful. This young man, his friends were of no value to him. They pulled him down into the gutter and then left him there. We're reminded of what the psalmist says in the first psalm in verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You see a progression, and you see a progression with this young, young man. He first had the desire within his heart to leave. Then he leaves. Then he has no good friends. Wrong kind of friends. And you see him in the gutter. The blessed man doesn't have that type of, of a situation. But you see in this, in Psalm 1 verse 1, a progression of sin and going away. First, that man walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. There's a walking by. Then there's a standing in the way of sinners. Instead of now just walking by them, he's there with them. And then sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He now, just instead of just walking by, now then standing, and then he just takes his place there. And that's where he's left. He left the presence, this young man, of a good father. Father loved his son greatly, even as all fathers would love their child, their son. 
and he mourned the loss of his son. Can you imagine the, your loss in that type of a situation and your desire for your son? And how that that desire would be so great and how you would mourn the loss of that son and desiring him to come home. Even as this father longed for and yearned, anticipated the return of his son. So God is that way as well. Thankfully, this young man came to himself. Repented and return. Look at verses 17 through 20 there in Luke 15. When he says, And he came to himself and said, How many hired servants have my, or uh, servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But yet when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You see both the attitude of the young man and of the loving father and the long-suffering nature of the father. As this young man comes to his senses, he comes to realize, here I am starving to death, and here's all of my in my father's house, all of these servants, and they have plenty of food. Food enough to spare. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to return to him. And I won't ask him to be like unto a son any longer. He realized his sin. And he was saying to himself, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. So just make me a, a, like a servant, a hired servant. But his father wouldn't have anything of it. And so we start seeing the long-suffering nature of God. Because this father never turned his back on his younger son, youngest son. And we start learning that God never forsakes us. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and verse 6, we're told to let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that I may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The father was still there. He was still looking out for his younger son so that when he would see him yet afar off, recognize him and run to him, kiss him and fall on his neck and restore him. God's not going to forsake us. But... Don't you realize that this younger son of yours had taken all of that money and he had wasted it in riotous living? He left the father's home? Don't you realize that? Yes, it doesn't matter. Because he had love for his son. And so he patiently waited for him. 1 Samuel 15, or 12 and verse 22 we're told that the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you His people. Again, in the 37th Psalm, in verse 28, The Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not His saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. God's not going to turn His back upon us. It's always the case that man is the one who leaves. And this is what separates God from man. It's man's leaving. Just as this younger son would not have been separated from the father if he had not left. 
He could have remained within the home and enjoyed all of the blessings of the home. But the younger son is the one who left. Isaiah would state in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 that the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Your sins, your iniquities have caused that separation. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open unto their prayers, Peter tells us. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. Man's sin is what separates him from God. Man's the one who leaves, but not God. Sin is that great divider between man and God. Man's sin. B.C. the long-suffering nature of God. You see in this parable the image of a father who's looking out at that road, looking for his son. And when he sees him a long ways off, he runs to him. Saw had compassion upon him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him in chapter 15 and verse 20 of Luke. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, and verse 20, we're told that which sometimes were disobedient. There's talking about the days of Noah. And here's these people who were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Noah spent about 120 years building the ark. During that 120 years, Noah is referred to as a preacher of righteousness. Here he is proclaiming by his actions, there's going to come a flood and destroy you. They could have been saved if they would have repented and turned to God. God's long suffering waited during the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, we're told that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering toward you or toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Long suffering nature of God. He's long suffering to us. Why? Because He doesn't want us to perish. He doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to see... To want us to, he does not want to see us separated from Him in an eternity of eternal punishment and torment and anguish. He wants us to draw to Him. And even as Jesus, as He was looking out over Jerusalem and would plead, would say, I, I would have drawn you under my wings, but ye would not. But God is long-suffering and He desires our salvation. When man returns then, we see that every blessing is restored. In Luke 15 again, verse 22 through verse 24, it says that the Father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was lost, or was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. All of the blessings that were in the father's home were restored to this young son even though he wasn't worth it. He wasn't worth the father's time and effort and love and kindness. He realized that when he came to himself. 
I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But as Father, we stored all of the blessings to Him anyway. When we repent of our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to forgive us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 and verse 9. All of the blessings can be restored. In Hebrews 8 and verse 12, we're told that God would be merciful to our sins and uh, to our unrighteousness. And our sins and our iniquities will He remember no more. He'll never hold them against us. And we will then enter into that church, the heavenly places where all spiritual blessings are found. And we will be blessed through this world and in the world to come have eternal life. If you've wandered into that foreign country, that far country, allowing sin to rule in your life, allowing the cares of this world, the pleasures of this world, the riches of this world to take over your life, to rule your lifestyle, and why not do as the prodigal son did? Come to yourself. Repent. Return to the Father that's standing there waiting with open arms to receive you. And even as when the lost sheep was found, the lost coin was found, there was rejoicing among all of the individuals and even in heaven itself. If you have fallen away and you repent and return unto God, there will be rejoicing in heaven over your salvation. If you've never obeyed the gospel, then repent and turn to God by that act of baptism upon your faith and confession of your faith. Come unto Him and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins and enter into the joys of thy Lord. You need to come this evening. We plead with you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.